physics degrees from the University of Waterloo. Uh, after receiving his PhD, uh, Professor Rothhorst went off to Colorado State University where he performed postdoctoral research uh, on cancer treatment um, that used a combination of heat radiation and drugs. Uh, in 1979, he joined the Atomic Energy of Canada as a section leader and continued uh, his uh, work on cancer treatment. In 1985, he became head of medical physics at Ottawa Hospital. And at that time, he was appointed full professor in physics at Carleton University and in radiology at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Professor Rophorst is a founding director of the Ottawa Medical Physics Institute, or OMPI, uh, which included both of these universities, as well as Health Canada, the National Research Council, and uh, Atomic Energy. Um, Professor Rophorst has supervised many graduate and uh, undergraduate students and uh, has published over 235 uh, research papers. He received the Ottawa Life Science Council Lifetime Achievement Award and later the Gold Medal Lifetime Achievement Award by the Canadian Organization of Medical Physics. Uh, in 2018, he was elected to the Wall of Fame uh, in Renfrew Collegiate High School, which I'm sure may be one of the top honors one gets <laughs> being memorialized in, on your high school wall is certainly a marvelous thing. But I think the most important one, of course, and, the, and certainly one that's close to my heart is he is the 2020 recipient of the Faculty of Science uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. And uh, we would love to have you here in person. Obviously, that's not going to happen, at least not this year, but perhaps in future years. But in lieu of that, um, I am asking you to take it away. Today, um, Professor Rophorst is going to uh, talk about a bench beside, uh, a, a bench to beside journey, hypothermia and radiation hyperthermia. I got to get that right. That's and uh, radiation and cancer treatment. So uh, with that, um, Professor Rothhorst. Thank you for the uh, kind uh, introduction and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, we'll start the uh, slideshow. And here we go. So as I look at this first slide, <laughs> I noticed that I made a there's a spelling mistake, Brian, when he pronounced the introduction to that uh, talk, it should be bench to bedside. So it is a bench to bedside journey in the treatment of cancer uh, using heat, which is hyperthermia and radiation in cancer treatment. So this is a dual modality cancer treatment. So we'll move to the next slide and I have a cursor or a laser pointer that I will be using. So here it is, follow the little red dot. This was my first uh, brush with the uh, medical physics cancer treatment uh, equipment. I was a, uh, a, a undergraduate and I just graduated and worked for Atomic Energy of Canada. And I got to tune this waveguide. This uh, is driven uh, by microwaves and accelerates electrons up to 25, uh, 25 million electron volts and can produce uh, electron beams and also x-ray beams. It's a fabulous machine. And I was like a kid in a candy store having the opportunity to work with something like that. Then to start, if you go from bench to bedside, you have to create a laboratory to do the in vitro research, which is research in a Petri dish. That's why it's vitro glass. It's also done in plastic. Then in the lab, you have to put the work, uh, you have to put the equipment in that you can work under sterile conditions so you don't get bacteria and viruses in your cell cultures. Then you develop cell culture assays, cell survival assays, and you start culturing different cells. And we cultured a quite a range of uh, human cancer cells. So I began at the University of Waterloo working with Professor Jack Kruve doing in vitro research on cells, but not so much directed at cancer, more at basic uh, mechanisms of radiation induced cell death. Then I moved to Colorado State University and uh, Again, working with uh, Professor Bill Dewey and doing a postdoc, and here we started doing cancer research on uh, 
on mammalian cells, humor, humor, uh, tumor cells using heat and radiation. I continued this work at Atomic Energy of Canada in Manitoba and then joined the Ottawa Regional Cancer uh, Center, the, the Ottawa Hospital in 1985. And that's where my journey in this presentation will start. So to build a laboratory, we have a vigorous group of people. And, and so we got the gang together and we started knocking out some walls and we were making progress. And I included this just for fun because that's as far as they let us go with our fun. And then the professionals took over and built us a real good lab laboratory to do cell research. And here is the beginning. That's uh, me sitting at a laminar flow hood. The laminar flow hood actually has a, uh, a curtain of air flowing inside. So you can put your hands through it and uh, work on the inside, but no, no bacteria or viruses can get in. So it's a sterile environment and you can start manipulating cells. And in this particular case, I was working with human brain tumor cells. So just a few details about the basic in vitro cell survival assay. In this particular case, we grew cells in a little Petri dish, and you've probably seen them on the news and on some of this virus research as well. The cells, are, you put them in the dish with fluid, and they attach to the bottom and form a monolayer just like a skin. So they fill up the dish. Then you suspend the cells out of this uh, flask and put them in suspension, count them through a particle counter, and now you have, you know, the number of cells you have in uh, per volume of liquid media. Then you put the cells in different petri dishes in known numbers, and they attach to the bottom of the dish and start growing out into what we call colonies. So you can actually visually see them. And knowing their numbers now, we can put the numbers uh, required to survive, let's say, six gray of radiation, or in this case, no irradiation here. And we get the number of colonies at the bottom. And knowing how many cells we've put in, we can actually determine the survival from what is left. In this slide here on the left hand side, these are the colonies that develop after about seven or eight, seven to 10 days. And, and so they are visible and you stain them and you can actually count them. And in this one, these receive the uh, six gray of radiation and you can see there are quite a few uh, less colonies. <clears throat> in addition, there's some big ones and some teeny weeny ones. And so there's been a lot of cell killing, but there's also been some slowing down of cell growth because of the damage they sustain. In this particular slide here, these are the brain tumor cells that I was manipulating in the laminar flow hood. And these ones are now, so th this is the survival curve that was generated. And as you see, we took the survival down, it's a log linear scale. We took the survival down uh, to almost three decades it, with 700, uh, the rads or centigrade by modern uh, language. Now, <clears throat> think about this for a second. We only killed uh, a thousand, uh, took the cells down to 0 0.001. If you have, let's say, a hundred million tumor cells in your, in a brain tumor, you're going to need a very large dose in order to sterilize that brain tumor. So that gives you a sort of an order of magnitude of of how <clears throat> difficult it is to treat some of these. Here I have a quick summary <clears throat> just to demonstrate the level of uh, radiosensitivity of different human cells. This is a brain tumor cell, the one we were working on. Here's another brain tumor cell. And then these are malignant melanoma cells. So these are cells of the pigment of the skin pigments, melanoma. <clears throat> Brain tumor cells are very, very difficult to treat because they're radio resistant. Melanoma cells respond better to radiation. The difficulty there is though that they spread out quickly through the body and are hard to find. 
So you have to catch them very early. And if for melanoma, we usually use uh, chemotherapy, which locates them. But for the others, radiation is the <clears throat> method of choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now let's get into hyperthermia, heat treatment. So we're going to look at uh, sequencing and thermal enhancement ratio. And I'll get to that in a minute, what that means. Then we're going to get into animal studies. And then we're going to look at some of the hyperthermia equipment that is used to induce heat in animals and humans. So here we have a thermal enhancement ratio explanation. The top curve is the, the uh, brain tumor cell curve. The bottom curve is the same cells, but these cells have been given 42 and a half degrees for one hour before irradiation. And now we have to calculate what the thermal enhancement ratio is here, dose B compared to dose A. Thermal enhancement ratio is defined as the radiation dose alone divided by the radiation dose uh, plus hyperthermia for equal effect. And in this case, the thermal enhancement ratio is 1.9, which means that we only have to give half as much radiation to achieve the same effect, which explains that hyperthermia is an ideal adjuvant for radiotherapy. Now, the question is, when do you give the hyperthermia and the radiation? And it is very sequence dependent. So here I show a graph of the radiation given right here in the middle in terms of the time frame, and we can give heat before to the left or heat after to the right. And the, the longer the interval between the two treatments, the lower the efficacy or the effect, the killing effect. So you wanna get your hyperthermia in as close to the radiation as possible. To do them simultaneously is almost impossible, except for certain conditions, and we'll encounter some of those later on. Now, we're going to get into some really interesting experimentation. <clears throat> what you see on your screen is a huge pig. So these are our animal studies, and in terms of blood flow and so on, pigs are one of the better models, animal models for humans. So in this particular case, as you start heating tissues, the tissue compensates by increasing the blood flow. So we're putting heat in and the tissue is increasing the blood flow and taking the heat away. So we need to know how much blood flow increases in order to get the hyperthermia intensity in there to make a difference in terms of getting the temperature up. There are never, several ways of doing that, but one of the sort of elegant ways is to use uh, radioisotope microspheres. And here I have four of them listed. Each of them has a different gamma energy. And if you inject these microspheres in at different times of the heat treatment, and then later after extract the tissue, you can find out how much of these uh, radiation microspheres are trapped at different heating times. The, just to mention that the microspheres are few in number and they don't really plug up the tissue, so that's not a problem. So here is the full experiment. Now this is a very busy <laughs> slide, but it'll, it'll become clear when you, we'll, we'll go to the top right. And this is number one is the first microsphere injection showing the basal level of blood flow in the tissue. Number two is the microsphere injection as the tissue, as the heat is turned on and you can see blood flow increases. Number three is during the heating and it shows blood flow starting to maximize out. And number four of the isotope is basically at the end and the heat starts to decline. And we do have a number five, but it simply shows that we're back to the level of number one. Now, if you look at this, all this uh, stuff here, this is a full operating room at the National Research Council who participated. And without them, we would not be able to do this kind of research. <clears throat> so if you look at A here, this is a microcouple array, which is inserted in the pig's tissue underneath 
the, the microwave applicator. And this arm is feeding microwaves at 2240 megahertz into this uh, aperture and which projects the microwaves in the tissue. This is approximately the same frequency as your microwave oven and starts to heat the tissue. And then over here at number C, this is the radioisotope microsphere injection system. So this, uh, this is really a very, very sophisticated experiment. <clears throat> the pig is under total anesthesia, but it's the kind of anesthesia that is used that does not affect the blood flow. And this is a fully licensed veterinarian to make sure that, the, that all the treatment and everything is going according to the plan. We're all in here, except I'm behind the camera in this slide. So if you want to do heating, you have different applicators that you can use. And in this particular one, we show a microwave applicator, but instead of 2240 megahertz, this is now down to 434 megahertz, and you can get a much deeper penetration of the heat because of the longer wavelengths of the, uh, the microwaves. If you want, you know, a human anatomy is obviously not flat. It's not like a flat surface or a phantom. <clears throat> you have curvature. So here is a microwave array that consists of many small microwave antennas. And that is flipped upside down. So you can see all the wires feeding in here. We flip this over, put it on a surface. And the surface has a small uh, water cooling bag so that the skin doesn't overheat. And then the microwave penetrates through that and into the underlying tissue. So that is a good technique for heating curved surfaces. But again, it's shallow heating. Now we get into deeper heating, radio frequency plate electrodes, 8 to 27 megahertz. And this is a, an interesting system. It's a big system. but the RF electrodes are here and one underneath. It's like a great big capacitor, basically, distributing heat, uh, my, uh, the RF uh, currents through the uh, patient, and the patient is the electrolyte. So here we have a patient. This big bulgy thing here is also a cooling system, so the patient can be cooled at the surface, not to damage the uh, surface tissue and the RF goes through. So this can be used for abdominal invasion of ovarian cancer, where the entire abdomen, abdominal cavity has to be heated. And in this case, you could use either radiation or chemotherapy to treat the patient. We had a, a lot of collaboration with China as well. So here's a picture when I'm in China and they have an RF heating apparatus here. Again, similar to the other one, a bit smaller, and this one can be more manipulated, but you can see this RF can also be really well used now for uh, brain tumors and smaller areas like neck tumors and so on. So, and uh, the, the Chinese were very aggressive at bringing in the experimentation from animals into humans much more quickly than we are in North America. This is a whole body heating system. And there are many types of systems, but this is simply a glass enclosure. The patient lies in there. We bring it up as high as we need to go on the patient up to the chest. And let's say you have abdominal cancer. It would heat the entire abdominal cavity and the rest of the patient as well, mind you. But in this case, we're uh, we're actually limited to the amount of heat we can put in. So 40 to 41 degrees and spacesuits have been used, NASA spacesuits. If you turn the cooling system off on spacesuits, they'll heat the body up really fast. That's an interesting thing to know. <clears throat> so 41 degrees, you might say is not much, but it is enough because tumors are more sensitive to heat than normal tissues. So if you have 41 degrees and then add some radiation or chemotherapy, you are going to get a significant effect. Now here, this might make you squirm a little bit, but uh, it needs to be shown. This is a multi-needle hyperthermia system that uses needles for radioactive needles are inserted 
and then also microwave antenna are inserted. And so you can actually, in this case, irradiate and do simultaneous heating. And <laughs> this is for prostate or for cervical cancer, and you insert it. Looks very painful, but if patients are under anesthesia. We were in the process of developing needles that were metallic, they were both radioactive and antenna, and they could be used simultaneously. So you needed only half the number of needles, and it was very elegant in terms of heating. Now, radiation. <clears throat> In order to deposit radiation accurately, there are a number of things that need to happen. You need to have good radiation equipment, and you need to graduate. It starts out way, way back historically with cobalt machines, but then we develop linear accelerators, and you'll see my previous slide soon. Then we have rotational radiotherapy. And of course, in order to do radiotherapy, you need to know where the tumor is, so you need to do good imaging. And in order to calculate the deposition of the radiation dose, you need a, a powerful computerized planning system. So here's that first slide that I showed you with that accelerator tube, and that was in 72. And unbeknownst to me, when I moved to Ottawa to start my medical, more on the medical side, my research program, I encountered this one. And this is me still looking as one of those younger undergraduate students from Waterloo. Fun days those were. Next slide then, here is the linear accelerator in a gantry mounted radiation therapy unit. This is called the Therac 20, and it produces 20 million electron volt X-rays or or electrons, and it can be rotated around the patient. So this gives us a sense of distributing the radiation dose and focusing it on the target. So here is a brain tumor that has been treated with a four beam radiation protocol, two beams coming in laterally from the top and two from the bottom. <clears throat> and we focus the radiation on the tumor in the middle of the brain. The tumor gets approximately 100% of the dose and then the dose falls off in the normal tissue. And we wanna make sure that we don't over irradiate the normal tissue. And normal tissue can take a fair bit, but you, you have to be careful. So the more beams we give, the more we spare the normal tissue uh, by distributing it around more, and the more we focus the radiation on the middle, on the tumor. So here is a super device. Could you imagine as a physicist how much fun you could have developing this apparatus? This is Professor Rock Mackey. He started his research in Ottawa at the National Research Council. <clears throat> and then he further developed this system at Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. This device contains a six million electron volt irradiator accelerator, a radiator can, that can produce electrons or photons, x-rays, and it actually irradiates in very thin slices. And you'll see that in the next slide. So here, it's, it actually has a spiral radiation protocol. And you can see the spiral here. Oh, here we go. So all of these are parts of a spiral. And so this unit moves a spiral across the length of the tumor in the longitudinal direction. And of course, it is controlled, the, the radiation is controlled by a fan beam. And here is a little insert that shows you the radiation, the six MeV radiation unit. It's a cone, but it has a slit aperture, produces a fan beam. The green thing here is the patient. And at the back here is we have a radiation detector because we can also image at 6 million electron volts, which is rare. That is a really uh, interesting application. We can also control the intensity of each of these rays in this fan beam right from zero to maximum. So now you can get a sense of, and here it is in a configured in the uh, approach where it would rotate around the patient. You get a sense of how well we can now target these tumors. 
So here we are, we were the first in Canada to install this unit uh, as a therapeutic unit. There was one in, uh, in another location as an alpha testing unit that was never used on patients. But we have this one here and it was installed early in the 20, 2001 or 2002, I forget exactly. This is me in the middle with the team. And we have a multi-institutional team here. We have two physicists from the Cancer Center. And this young lad here, he's a young physicist. He was my, uh, my resident, then became a full physicist. And now he's department head. He followed me when I retired. <clears throat> These are the uh, staff, uh, the professors from Carleton University. Here's a, uh, pr a professor from uh, Health Canada. And here's a professor from the National Research Council of Canada. So this is, this is a, a really super, super good device for radiotherapy. We won't go into too much detail here because there's so much to see. But, you know, here in the corner, right by my picture, I guess I'm not sure if you see my picture. But anyways, there is this little area here. This is a chest. And we're looking from the feet towards the head. These are two lungs here. This is the heart. And this is the chest wall. And there is an invasive tumor on the chest wall. And we have to try to irradiate that. And you can see it's a kind of a complex shape without over radiating the two lungs and the heart and other tissues. So having this tomotherapy unit, this rotational unit, we can give the total dose, which in this case is uh, 50 gray or 5,000 centigray to the tumor while sparing the lung, which is getting a lot less and the heart as well. So, and actually this is a uh, invasive breast cancer. That's what this was. So this next slide simply gives us a little bit more detail on how well that dose was distributed. Just look at that. It's really highly focused on that tumor and we're sparing the heart and the uh, two lungs. And you can see by the color graph here what the radiation doses were. And the maximum, of course, is on the tumor. Now, <clears throat> it's time to figure out how to find a tumor. Well, we brought in a uh, Phillips Gemini system. And if you front, there's a big gantry here, a circle. And at the back, if you peek through the hole, you'll see another circle back here and you'll get a better view of it in a minute. This is a PET CT scanner. So I think most of you probably know what a CT or CAT scanner is. Using, you know, it uses a spiral uh, beam. In this case, it's a fan beam, but just like the one I've showed you before. And the scanner, rotates around the uh, tumor and uh, the patient and basically uh, uh, images the patient looking at the radiological density of all the tissues. And so you get basically a complex x-rays and it spirals around and also moves in a spiral so that you can have numbers of slices. A high speed cons uh, computer construct these into a three-dimensional tumor volume. Now, at the front, we have a PET scanner. This is a positron emission tomography unit. It uses the radiation which is injected into the patient. So there's no radiation unit in here, but it, is, has, it has a circular annulus array of detectors. So it can detect the radiation emitted by the patient and the patient is slowly moved through here. So again, it's creating slices which can be reconstructed in a three-dimensional volume. So we brought this in and there's the whole team again, lots of uh, high powered physicists here. You do need a lot of physics in this uh, type of, uh, uh, of uh, profession. And just to throw it out there, you know, the, the medical industry, as it's getting more and more technological, do need physicists to participate in those kinds of endeavors. So having said this, <clears throat> I brought this in and uh, Hamed here, 
He is a pets uh, expert, this person right here. And he uh, basically commissioned this part of the system. And just to let you know that every morning, every day, I'm lucky. I get two CAT scans and one PET scan for free. And here it is. My two kittens, quick and slick, give me two CAT scans, one from each, as they sit in the beams of our post and beam house. And then down below, my trusty old hound, Leroy, gives me a PET scan. <laughs> Now, the mechanism of PET. You need a positron emitting isotope. In order to create one, you can bombard oxygen 18 with uh, 18 MeV uh, protons produced in a cyclotron. It'll convert to F18, which is now a positron emitter. The half-life of F18 is very short. So once you've done this, you have to have a cyclotron close at hand, otherwise you're in trouble. And luckily for us, the Heart Institute has uh, a cyclotron, which is just next door to us. <clears throat> the physical characteristics is that F18 decays by positron emis uh, emission. And the positron, uh, as it uh, is emitted, it uh, collides or interacts with an electron, disintegrates, and emits two 511 keV photons that travel in anti-parallel directions. Now, how does this give us an advantage? Well, it's this little molecule over here. This is fluorinated deoxyglucose. And the nature of tumor metabolism is such, it metabolites rapidly and it loves to take up glucose. It needs that for its growth. So you inject this into a patient and this goes into tumors very quickly. So now you'll have tumors that have this metabolite in it. And so with the 511 keV gammas coming out in anti-parallel directions <clears throat> and an annular detection array around the system, you can imagine how quickly you can pinpoint where that tumor is. So just think about this. This is a hypothetical treatment plan. And in the middle, I have a hypothetical x-ray image of the tumor. Now, in order to plan the tumor volume to be irradiated, you have to have a gross tumor volume, which is the orange, which is calculated by the computer. <clears throat> then in order to have a computed volume by the computer, it adds another volume around it in order to take care of any smaller cells or lumps that might have escaped detection. And finally, this is how the medical therapy works. You also have a planning treatment volume, which takes an extra little bit around the outside just to, be made, just to make sure. So this is our CT image. Now, when we add the PET scan to it, all of a sudden the PET unit says, hey, there's tumor all over here now. How is this possible? Well, the white is a radiological image. The red is a metabolic actively image. So that means that there is tumor here that is radiologically probably not as dense as the main thing here, the white, but it is metabolically active, indicating that this is probably a more aggressive part of the tumor than the white. <clears throat> so again, we would have missed it by having the treatment plan. So here I show you a real situation. Here we have a lung tumor. And this is again, we always look from the feet towards the head. This is the chest of a patient. Here's the heart the uh, lung on the left-hand side and the lung on the right-hand side. The tumor is here, it's the red volume. However, the red volume is the radiological image. When we add the PET image to it, we get all of this extra tumor in here, which is the yellow stuff. So if you had just irradiated the red, we would have been in really bad shape. We would have missed <clears throat> the most aggressive part of this tumor. And here, if you look closely, 
you'll see a, a small faint red line. This is the radiological volume. And we're taking a look from the uh, forward on top from the chest in now instead of from the feet forward. And you can actually see the, uh, the metabolic part is not coincident with the radiological part. So the PET is saying we must increase the area or the volume that we irradiate. This is basically a summary of what you can do with a PET scanner. So here, this tells, this is a tumor of the esophagus and the X-ray CT tells us this little white area is the tumor, but if you add the PET to it, you'll see it's much bigger. So this is basically telling you the stage of that tumor, the size and how aggressive it is. <clears throat> then you can map treatment responses. Here is a tumor in the middle of the body, just below the heart. This is called the mediastinal area. And it could be a Hodgkin's or a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is mapping the physical and active tumor volume. So here again, it's a lymphoma. And in this case, it shows you there's a huge tumor mass here, but the really active areas are inside that mass. And then these are the two kidneys. And if you have a lot of experience, you'll realize that kidneys do metabolize, so these are not tumors. You have to also use your experience to differentiate what is active tumor and what is not. So now we get into clinical application and how do we treat a patient? Well, we need a microwave applicator and we're going to demonstrate uh, hypothetical thyroid treatment, demonstrate chest wall treatment, and then we're going to show the thermal enhancement ratio. So here we go. This is Dr. Donju and myself. Dr. Donju was head of the radiation department, radiotherapy department, and a close friend of mine. This is one of our technologists, Sally, and she uh, agreed to uh, sit for this demonstration and the Ottawa Citizen took this picture. <clears throat> and basically this is our microwave applicator here. Our microwave unit is just over, I put my cursor over here. So the applicator's here and the, and the uh, generator's here. <clears throat> and this is a computer array that uh, basically tells us the temperature. So there are microthermal couples inserted into the tumor in this hypothetical patient. And just a little aside here, this system was donated by IBM. Uh, we did uh, go out to get support from industry. And it was only a year later that one of the IBM employees was treated this way. So it was kind of closing a nice circle for us. And we did treat a thyroid tumor on a patient. She was elderly. The thyroid tumor was highly radiation resistant, did not respond well to radiation. When we heated it and then irradiated it again, the tumor shrank away so fast that we needed surgeons to, con, uh, to control the tumor regression. Here is a hyperthermia treatment of the abdomen, the abdomen, and also we could treat the, the chest for chest wall recurrence of breast cancer. And again, here's the microthermocouple array output and the uh, applicator is, is this little thing over here. Whoops, there, this and this. So how well does this work? Well, for breast cancer recurrence, so let's say if we have breast cancer and the cancer invades the chest wall, so that is the below the breast now. This is where the muscle are and the ribs reside and so on. That is very hard to get at. So in this slide, we show the thermal enhancement ratio. So in this particular case, the, uh, the patient has had a mastectomy, so the breast is removed, but now these tumors keep coming up on the chest wall. So in order to get a response, and you want to get 100% as a complete response, that means everything is gone, you basically have to get the doses really high. Already we're at 80%, maybe 70% here, but we're up at 60 gray, so 6,000 centigrade, that's a pretty high dose. Now, when you apply heat to this, 
probably about an hour at maybe 42 or 43 degrees, and which is quite tolerant, tolerable. The patient responds, the tumors respond much more quickly. And for example, to get the 70, we would need a dose about half as much as with radiation alone. So this gives us a thermal enhancement ratio of two. So that really helps sparing the radiation damage to uh, the normal tissue because the tumor are more sensitive to the heat and radiation treatment than the normal tissue. And uh, secondly, I guess the, the heat treatment in this particular case at 42 and 43 degrees is not painful. So we have a much better outcome. And again, just to mention that this can be done with, uh, with various chemotherapy agents as well, but that's a whole other area of study. <clears throat> now, I've shown a number of people in this picture, uh, physicists from our institution at uh, Ottawa Cancer, the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center, Carleton University, the National Research Council, and Health Canada, and of course, industry as well. But I wanna mention to you one of the most important group of contributors. And these are the graduate students. So these are all graduate students that I personally supervised. They were just a great bunch of fine people, always inquisitive. I think over the years they talked me more than I talked them. But uh, you can see many of them are from Carleton Physics Department over here too. But there are also some from the University of Ottawa and the, the phys, Carleton was all physics. University, I supervised them in radiology, biology and physiology departments. So I would give a great big shout out to uh, all my graduate students. And uh, this ends and I'm open for questions. This is a deer that was in our field in front of our house at uh, dawn and uh, the moon is just setting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a marvelous talk. Uh, I'm sorry that you can't hear the applause. I think there is virtual applause that's possible, wow. but this is, uh, this is the new reality under uh, COVID-19. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'll entertain questions and, and just jump right in and, and, and ask your question. I, I don't see any right now, but I, I'll, maybe I'll prime the pump here and ask one uh, from me. Um, I, so th it's really interesting, this heat treatment. I'd never known that. Uh, I'd never heard of that before. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, and you described it, but and, and perhaps you said it, but I missed it. What is the physiological reason that adding heat to a tumor and then, you know, reduces the amount of radiation that's required to, you, you mentioned the blood flow increases, but, but what actually is the physiology of, of, of this yeah, the, going the, on? The physiology is, is really important here. And there are a number of elements that in this physiology. First is that tumors are more sensitive to heat than normal tissues. And secondly, tumors undergo, in many cases, an anaerobic pathway to glycolysis and create uh, uh, hypoxic environments and also acidic environments. And these make tumors, again, extremely sensitive to both heat and radiation. The hypoxic one, no, that's the opposite. They become radiation resistant. But if you look at hypoxia and heat treatment, the heat uh, hypoxia sensitizes to heat. So there are a huge number of complementary effects that happen. And thirdly, one of the major forms of radiation recovery and survival in cells is, of course, DNA repair, whether it's recombinational repair or excision repair. <clears throat> and, and DNA does that very effectively. But if you apply heat, you start to damage the radiation repair enzyme, so DNA is misrepaired and can result in cell death. And, it's, and how was it discovered? Uh, what, what, how did you think to add heat? How was that discovered? It was discovered probably about 
eight, nine hundred years ago <laughs> when, <laughs> you know, like all of these things, these are not new. Some of the uh, older, way, way back in the olden days, as they say, they were uh, dealing with tumors. There was no such thing as radiation. And uh, maybe there were some forms of naturopathic chemotherapy. I don't know. But the heat was applied to as a desperate means to deal with tumors. And they found it was very effective. Oh, that's interesting. I don't, are there any, uh, any other questions? Particularly Good student one. questions? Yeah. This yeah. Uh, overall. Oh, you know, go ahead first. I'll go after. Okay, thanks. So um, in all the pictures that you showed throughout the presentation, uh, there, there were a lot of old computers in the background that I could see. So uh, I was wondering how has the advancement of computers changed the uh, day to day in your work? So are you doing more simulations now? Do you do you spend more time now just writing code or how how has that affected your day to day activities? That uh, that question is dead on. It's it's a key question because as we move further and further into modern technology and uh, medical treatments, computer are computers are a cornerstone. And in radiation therapy, along with hyperthermia, as this talk is about, <clears throat> we could not plan these radiation treatment volumes without uh, computers. And as you look through the progression from the brain tumor that I showed with four beams to the tomotherapy unit with rotational beams, it requires faster and faster computers, and in some cases, computer networks. So to reconstruct the treatment volume. And of course, in the PET scanner and the CT scanner, there are huge computers in there to uh, reconstruct the three-dimensional treatment uh, images as well. So, and, and there are other applications as well in different uh, regimens of, of uh, medical practice. They're everywhere. So yes, you, you hit on a central point. Without the computers, we wouldn't be able to do anything like this. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, a follow up, I guess. Um, do, do you think that computers have enabled the use of um, potentially more, uh, more dangerous or more, um, I guess, like if you are applying heat to, to a tumor, do, do you think that computers are enabling you to apply uh, more quote unquote dangerous amounts of heat that we couldn't before? Dangerous amount, are you saying of heat or radiation or dangerous amount in, in making mistakes? Um, I, I, I guess I, a little bit of both that uh, if you are, like if, if, if I guess you are writing code to apply some certain amount of radiation and like the, the, the doses are pretty high and if, if you make a mistake in the code, a bug could, uh, it, it, would, it wouldn't lead to a software crash here, it could lead to someone dying potentially so yes i mean uh, again that that's a, a central question uh, if you look at that initial waveguide that i showed that was uh, inserted into a radiotherapy unit and became the first computer controlled radiotherapy unit that computer controlled radiotherapy unit was great at uh, irradiating specific locations where the tumor was However, the computer program of that unit had a bug in it. And at one point, the, uh, I guess manipulations of the system were done in such a way that the bug showed itself. And this was to be a patient who was irradiated with, was to be a, a brain tumor, was to be irradiated with uh, um, x-rays, but Instead, the target moved out of the way and the patient was irradiated with electrons. Now, you might say, so what? But the, electro the x-rays are created by a Bremsstrahlen process. The electrons bombard the target. The efficiency of that process is less than 1%. So you need 99% uh, of, e uh, of electrons to produce 1% of x-rays. So when the target went out of the way, <clears throat> that patient received over uh, you know thousands thousands of fold increase in radiation dose and that was uh, the first time that happened the patient said i feel a funny tingling in my brain 
and within three, four days, the patient died. So yes, it's very dangerous, and you do have to have a huge number of experiments uh, to prove that the technology is good and, and flaw bug free. On the other side, in the application of uh, the radiation, how you apply it, the tumor volume and so on, <clears throat> I think initially it was the lack of imaging equipment and uh, computer reconstruction equipment that probably caused uh, the missing of tumors. So that would be harmful to the patient, but with better computers, with better imaging technology, things keep better. So I think in that way, you know, it's, it's fantastic to have really good and, and powerful calculation uh, algorithms in computers. But again, like you, we all know that, you know, whether we're in the space shuttle or whether in the hospital, there are bugs in software that's being used and we have to be very, very careful. So uh, we got some questions in the chat. Why do tumors shrink? Where does the tissue go? Oh. That's a fun question. <laughs> yeah, it's also, well, think of it also, if you have a great big boil or abscess and it sort of, dis, uh, it, it breaks open and you got this gushy, nasty stuff and it disappears and suddenly everything goes, we get some scabs and everything goes away. So what really happens is that the body is filled with uh, responsive cells and uh, the, uh, the main group of these are macrophages and they come in and clean up all the dead tissue. It just, uh, you know, the, I guess uh, breaks it down into submolecules and then it comes out in the urine and the feces, so it's gone. Of course, <clears throat> the healing power of surrounding cells, because every organ has uh, stem cells in it, the, it will regrow into the area that has where the tumor has been. So it's a wonderful process. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting, that question, because if you look at putting those cells in a Petri dish, the, if you put skin cells in a Petri dish, they will fill the bottom of the Petri dish and form a whole new skin. And I had a, a student who actually put uh, heart cells in a Petri dish. And once it filled the bottom of the Petri dish, the heart cells started beating. So the, the oh. surrounding cells of the organs have a powerful way to regenerate what is lost. Whoa, it started beating. Yep. And we also produced a layer of retinal cells. And these, this is the beginning of, uh, of artificial or uh, in vitro induced retinal transplants. Interesting. Are there other questions? I have one if you don't mind. Yep. Um, I just want to kind of clarify it or kind of dumb it down for myself. So what you're saying is the CAT scan will identify where the tumor is, and then the PET scan identifies how it's interacting with its environment? Would that uh, be yes, yes and no. The, the, uh, the CAT scan basically looks at the radiological density of tissues. So let's say the tumor is a little bit more dense than the surrounding tissue. The radiation absorbance, uh, which is registered on the detector, simply says, okay, here's a tissue that is absorbed a bit more. So that's a different kind of tissue. So as this thing spins around and uh, does all the slices and the re 3D reconstruction, <clears throat> it will basically see a volume of material that is not a normal organ. So that is how the tumor is defined. That uh, you say that uh, tissue should not be there. And sometimes it's more dense, but sometimes it's less dense, but it's based on the radiological absorbance of the x-rays. Now the PET, <coughs> it's totally different. It really is because of the uh, fluorinated deoxyglucose, tumors need glucose to grow. So as you inject this into the patient, the tumors start taking up the uh, radioactive deoxyglucose. And as it resides in the tumor, it may reside in tissues that are tumor, that are, is the tumor, but do, do not have quite the radiological difference compared to the surrounding tissue. So now we have a metabolic way to define what is tumor tissue as well as a radiological, and both work in concert. Thank you. 
Great. That's uh, so did, before uh, we let you go, uh, it's been quite a while. When were you last in Waterloo? Oh, that's quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Wait a minute. No, only two years ago. I was at the uh, at a part uh, at a graduate student get together party with Dr. Uh, Professor Jack Crew. Ah, OK. So uh, yeah. so tell us, uh, you know, what are your observations about uh, the changing landscape in Waterloo from when you were a student in the 70s, <laughs> uh, till now? Well, when, when I was a student, I lived on uh, Columbia Street and used to walk to the university. I'd walk through a muddy field. The, uh, the physics building was one building. And uh, there was not much, it was a huge parking lot. The optometry building had not yet been built. Uh, and there were some trailers. I guess the submarine was there. That's the engineering building. And the old farmhouse for the graduate students were there. And then it started to grow like crazy. I mean, everything just expanded. And uh, the, the growth was amazing. Yeah, but uh, we had a lot of fun there, especially in the olden days when we had the, uh, the smaller physics department. We had a, uh, a team of graduate students who uh, got ourselves into a teeny weeny little bit of trouble. We built rockets and blew out a, bin, a window one time, which was not well received, but uh, what can you do, eh? <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. I used to build rockets too, and I've knocked <laughs> windows out myself, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's been great to have you. It'd uh, be wonderful to have you back in town. You can see, you know, Waterloo as a town has just changed tremendously. We now have a trolley system. There are, you know, high rises going up everywhere. So it's quite the urban center. And of course, physics is, uh, has expanded tremendously. And, and so right. it's, it's very exciting. So when COVID is over, uh, we hope to have you back here uh, physically in three dimensions. And not just two. So, uh, and congratulations on uh, on on your recent award. And um, I just wish you well and stay in touch with us. So, thanks again. Yeah. Take good care. If we can all give us a round, if give uh, Peter a round of virtual applause, that would be great. Thank you. And the, you uh, to, the one thing I want to mention, stuff. if you're going to use this presentation, we need to correct the title. Thanks for picking that up, Brian. <laughs> uh, I just stumbled over it. That's all. <laughs> but it's great. Take care and uh, stay in touch and be well. Okie doke. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you.